how much an organization spends on its charitable programs. If you feel uncomfortable or pressured into making a donation, you can file a confidential complaint online at sos.sc.gov. Remember, give from the heart, but please give smart. Watch WRDW News at 5.30 weekdays for What the Tech. Sponsored by Augusta Preparatory Day School, leading the CSRA in STEM education. I owe this massive thank you to everyone who takes the time out of their day to donate. They saved my life, and I'm so grateful for that. From our family to yours, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Live from Augusta. You're watching News 12, live at 5. Well, hundreds of people in our community rely on the Family Counseling Center each year, but right now, the nonprofit's days are numbered. The center gives anybody who needs it free mental health services, with more than 400 people served this year and hundreds more on a waiting list. But as Nick Veland explains, the center has until the new year to figure out how to stay open. The Family Counseling Center behind me is running out of time to stay open. As it stands right now, they're short of this year's fundraising goal, and they're hoping not to enter the new year behind on money. The center is down $8,000 heading into 2024. The executive director said that people have been coming forward to help, but it hasn't been enough. So, the center is in survival mode. Everyone has been working hard to stay afloat, on top of continuing to provide mental health services to those who don't have insurance or can't afford it. They'll be hitting the ground running in 2024 to hopefully turn the tables and figure out a way to stay open. But Selena Keys fears it might be too late. So we are in a desperate need right now. Um, we hope if we can get past the first quarter, like I said, we're going to be actually doing some fundraising events so that we're not just asking for donations in this capacity. Um, but right now, it's just important to understand as we're moving into the new year and people are getting that new start, part of that new start is getting their mental health needs met. And without Family Counseling Center, they may not have a place to go. And coming up all new on News 12 SS Block, we'll have more on how this center is looking to stay alive and how you can help keep these services coming to the community. All right, thanks, Nick. Switching gears to weather now, we got a chance to see some blue skies today, but it was a little bit chillier for us as we check in with First Alert Chief Meteorologist Riley Hale. And Riley, what do our last few days of 2023 have in store for us? Oh, well, if you thought it was chilly today, I got uh, some bad news for you. It is going to get downright cold over the next couple of days. Friday and Saturday, our temperatures should feel about 10 degrees colder than what our high temp did hit earlier this afternoon. It did feel uh, cooler, though, than what we've seen so far this week. So instead of the mid-60s, we topped out right at 60, which is actually our average high for this time of year. So we're just starting that downward trend with our temperatures over the next couple of days. You're definitely going to notice it's not feeling as mild out there. Cold temps Friday and Saturday and only expecting those temperatures to increase to the upper 50s for highs Sunday into the start of the new year. So it looks like the start of 2024 definitely will be on the colder side for us. Here's a look at some of our tower cams across the region and blue sky everywhere we look. It is a beautiful day. Finally cleared out those clouds around lunchtime and temperatures did reach close to 60 today in most spots, but right now we are dropping into the 50s and we're going to continue that trend through the 50s over the next couple of hours, but it is going to be much colder tonight and likely down to the 30s by early Friday. All Thanks to this cold front, this is pushing uh, east across the region. So behind this front is where we're going to find all this cold air currently feeling like 35, uh, 35 right now in Memphis. Uh, so we'll have a look at how cold our temps will get over the next couple of days in just a bit. Let's get a quick update on your first alert traffic. And now, first alert traffic. Here's a live look down I-20 looking at eastbound, westbound lanes and not really too many issues to mention at the moment. So if you are crossing state lines, not looking like a, too much of a slowdown there. Going out to Grovetown next, Lewiston Road does look busier than what we've seen most days this week. So I think a few more people have definitely uh, showed up back in town. So there on Lewiston Road, definitely pretty busy on the overpass. I have an update on these cold temps for you in just about 10 minutes. Thanks, Riley. The search for a murder suspect in Aiken County is over. 34-year-old Tony Muldrow is now in custody after a deadly Christmas Eve shooting on Squire Street. Now, the victim has been identified as 29-year-old Rondra Mc, uh, Gomillion. Authorities say a witness saw Gomillion in Muldrow in an argument before shots rang out. Muldrow is being charged with manslaughter in possession of a weapon during a violent crime. 
11 police officers are on administrative leave as SLED investigates a deadly encounter between police and a suspect in North Charleston. This happening late last night when police responded to a gas station for shots fired. Several officers returned to the scene and authorities say the suspect, 33-year-old Winston Dunham, brandished his gun in their direction before firing once at the officers. The officers returned fire and Dunham was killed. No officers were injured. This is the 41st shooting involving a police officer this year in South Carolina. That number is up nine from last year. Four Georgia lawmakers now claim they were victims of prank 911 calls over the holidays. Georgia Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, along with State Senators T Kim Jackson, Clint Dixon, and Kay Kirkpatrick, say that they were victims of home invasion threats. This false reporting is also known as swatting. All of the lawmakers say they are fine, but are concerned about the resources wasted on these efforts. State Senator Dixon says he plans to address swatting threats during the next legislative session. South Carolina is one of two states with the highest number of flu cases in the country, according to the CDC and DHEC. This is a map showing the latest activity levels of the flu. As you can see, it's South Carolina and Louisiana with the highest levels, with Georgia not too far behind. DHEC says the best way to prevent further infection is to take the flu seriously. We really think it's important to get the message out to our community that it's not too late to get vaccinated. Uh, hand washing still works really well. Stay home if you're sick. Uh, cover your cough and, um, you know, wear a mask if you're concerned um, or if you're going to be around somebody who maybe is at high risk. This year, 12 people in South Carolina have died from the flu and data shows more people in the Palmetto State are going to the hospital for flu this year than in 2022. Senator Graham is fighting back against a proposed bill in New York that would require all new food services at rest areas to stay open seven days a week. This could include some Chick-fil-A locations, which are closed on Sundays. Graham visited a Manhattan location to share his support for the restaurant, even though that particular location would not be affected by this bill. On X, Graham declared war on the bill, saying if it goes through, he will introduce legislation withholding federal funds from any city or state that require Chick-fil-A to stay open on Sundays. For more than six months, the Georgia Full Story Project has worked to help preserve more historic spaces in the Peach State. As we head into 2024, Aria Janelle shows us how the project looks to expand. Oh, the stories this building could tell you. It sits on the corner of West 36th and Florence here in Savannah, Georgia. Back in 1896, this was Cherry Hospital. Black doctors and nurses can be trained in medicine and offer quality care to black people who otherwise were not able to get it. That was Maxine Bryant. She and Rebecca Fenwick are just two people of a much larger group that are working to tell Georgia's untold stories. Through the Georgia's Full Story Project, they're collecting stories from people like you and I and researching facts in hopes of getting more places and areas onto the National Register of Historical Places. Many sites have, have been overlooked um, and, and to be honest, I don't think um, historic preservation uh, in general has always been equitable and the National Register is just a product of that. The Historical Society only has a limited information. They have a wealth of information, but it's limited in terms of true, actual, factual stories about black people. Cherry Hospital is an example of the types of places they want to bring to the National Register's attention. They're looking for places that are critical, vital, important places in African American history. So far, more than a dozen places have been submitted to the Georgia's Full Story Project as places that deserve recognition and preservation. But we know there are so many others. But why would a place want to be on the National Register? Fenwick tells me it will help these special places get funding to fix things up and help preserve it for the future. For example, Charity Hospital just got money to fix its windows, giving it the TLC that was much needed while also preserving a piece of history. Even black people don't know the black history that's here in Savannah. And so that's why it's important to fill in the gaps. And that's what we're trying to do through Georgia's full story. So as you drive by the places you know have made an impact on yourself and your history, take a second, grab a picture, and send in what you know. Because for history to stick around, it has to be preserved. Still to come, lawmakers are pushing for new laws to keep your money from being seized at the airport. We'll show you how coming up next. Riley?
Sunny skies made a return today, and now we're dropping our temperatures for the rest of the week. We'll have that full forecast just after the break. A beautiful view from our Beach Island camera. We're getting closer to the sunset here. Clear skies overhead, and we're going to have a great opportunity to check out uh, what is still the near full moon, that cold moon that uh, was actually technically full earlier into the week. Still going to be shining bright tonight. And also you can catch out uh, Jupiter and Saturn just after sunset. Those will be shining bright tonight as well. Temperatures upper 50s right now. We'll drop through the 50s the next few hours, and then I would imagine most spots are in the mid to low 40s as we get closer to the midnight hour. It's going to be overnight into early tomorrow morning will eventually see our temps most likely bottom out into the 30s. So it is going to feel a lot colder throughout the day Friday, noticeably colder for most spots. It's going to be breezy along with these cold temps. So the wind chill should actually keep our feel like temperatures in the 30s up until close to lunchtime. So get ready for this. Make sure you are bundled up. Not only Friday, you can see it doesn't really change too much into our Saturday either. So this is going to be a very cold stretch of the next 48 hours across the region. Now the wind will be picking up a sustained wind, generally less than 20 miles an hour, but we'll see those gusts every now and again uh, throughout the day Friday and Saturday most likely to get close to 25 miles an hour. Not really enough to cause any major impacts unless you're going to be up at the lake. That's definitely enough to create a little bit of a chop on the water there. So make sure you are staying safe if you're heading up to Clark's Hill. Saturday, Sunday, cooler high temps, low 50 Saturday upper 50s by Sunday, generally sunny skies uh, on Sunday, but we are going to hang on to just partly cloudy conditions on Saturday with along with those breezier conditions sticking around at least the first half of the weekend. If you have plans to head out Sunday night for the New Year's Eve holiday, we got temps upper 40s around 7 o'clock. By the time we get to midnight, once we bring in the new year, that's when those temps will already be chilly, most likely in the upper 30s. We do look to stay dry through Sunday night, but there is going to be the opportunity maybe for some rain as we head late to our Monday holiday next week. For tonight, though, generally clear skies. Temps will be feeling colder by tomorrow morning in the 30s. We'll see those work their way close to 50 tomorrow afternoon, and then maybe a few passing clouds in the afternoon. But I would imagine we see a good bit of sun out there tomorrow. Saturday, same concept. Waking up in the 30s, a little bit breezy. Afternoon highs staying near 50, and then we're just going to stay nice and dry all the way through our Sunday. Now, this is a look ahead to our Monday holiday, so New Year's Day next week. It is going to be, uh, there's going to be the opportunity maybe for a few showers. Now, looking at our two models here, neither one of them shows a ton of rain. And even this one here, the European model, not really showing much at all for us here locally. So don't cancel anything just yet. But it looks like a, another front is going to pass through around this time frame. Possibly could bring us a few showers. And the timing of that looks to be mainly late to Monday, uh, possibly as late as Monday night. So once again, shouldn't impact a lot of our plans during the day Monday. Once we get past that, we're looking at a cold start to our 2024. Highs in the 50s and lows in the 30s. Thanks, Riley. Lawmakers from both sides of the aisle want to make it harder for the government to take your cash without charging you with a crime. Brendan Keith breaks down how it's happening in plain sight and what Congress wants to do about it. $1.3 billion. That's how much the Department of Justice seized in cash last year alone. The largest agency was the DEA and the largest program in the DEA was the airport interdiction operation. The agencies get to keep the money they seize and Congress wants to change that. From battleground to common ground, unlikely allies are joining forces in the nation's capital. In this country, we believe that everyone is innocent until proven guilty. A deprivation of civil liberty that can happen to any of us. They just took it and they said, sue us. Have you ever tried suing the government? It's not that easy to sue the government. Members of Congress are responding to our investigative series, exposing drug agents hiding in plain sight at airport gates, seizing cash from passengers without arresting them. This isn't criminal asset forfeiture where you arrest someone and then take their assets as part right. of the criminal prosecution. Right. They're not charging them. They're arresting the money, not the person. In fact, I think technically the charge is against the money. It's bizarre. It's some old maritime law or something from way back when, but they charged the money, not the person. But I think the important thing is it's turning justice on its head. You're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. Not, oh, you're guilty, give me your stuff, and then you can have it back if you prove you, you didn't get it through ill-gotten gains. And that's not the way our country's supposed to work here in a divided United States capital. This issue is bringing both Republicans and Democrats together. It's about both civil rights and civil liberties.
oftentimes they are the same. The vast majority of people they're stopping are people of color, and the largest single group is black men. It's a matter of racial profiling. Georgia Congressman Hank Johnson is one of nine Democrats and nine Republicans co-sponsoring the Fifth Amendment Integrity Restoration Act. The power of the government to simply seize property just based on a belief, a mere belief, an unfounded belief even, that property is associated or connected with uh, criminal activity, but not off the backs of innocent citizens. And you'll catch some crooks in this process as well. But sadly, we're catching too many innocents who have to fight their way out of this bind, and many of them can't do it. Michigan Republican Tim Wahlberg has filed his bill over and over for nearly a decade. Criminals, actual criminals, have more rights than innocent people who have their money taken. Under civil asset, criminals have more. That's why civil asset is such a valuable tool. It can be used well, but it can be abused. And uh, because you don't have to meet the standards that you would for a criminal uh, asset forfeiture. The FAIR Act would force the government to prove to a federal judge that seized money was from crime with clear and convincing evidence. And all cash from civil forfeitures would go to the Treasury's general fund. Federal agencies and local police would no longer get to keep the money they see. It's, it's a, a perverse incentive. incentive. That unified message is echoing across the aisle, pushing the FAIR Act through a House committee for the first time by unanimous vote. That unanimous vote didn't happen in just any committee. The bill passed out of judiciary, the setting for some of the most partisan battles in recent years. Yet Republicans and Democrats appear to agree on at least one thing, to make it harder for the government to seize money from innocent people. I think it was rotten to the core. It's now passed through a committee in the House and we're hoping to pass it in the Senate as well. Some law enforcement groups have come out against this federal legislation, including the National Sheriff's Association, which says that this legislation would essentially be a gift to the drug cartels. It's up to the Speaker of the House now to bring this to the floor by the end of next year for an up or down vote. Well, coming up, Clemson football is preparing for its bowl game and its handshake tradition. We'll give you a peek into some of the players' favorites. First alert. Well, Clemson is preparing for the Gator Bowl tomorrow, and its tradition of custom handshakes has helped build the bond between teammates to get there. Carmen Jemmy shows us how the handshakes go way beyond appearances. It just really puts into perspective that I'm just playing the game that I love and that I have loved since I was a kid. A simple greeting can go a long way. Custom handshakes are a Clemson football tradition. Some say it's a waste of time, but linebacker Barrett Carter says his 15 different handshakes serve an important purpose. Football, it can be stressful at times, but at the end of the day, once you're doing those handshakes, it just like it makes you feel like you're a little kid again and playing uh, Pop Warner football. So uh, that's like my mindset with it. It's just kind of like an escape from all the stressing and whatever, and just like just you know, just playing with the game with my brothers. The childlike creativity always makes for a good photo op. Running back Will Shipley says his favorite is with his roommate at one-two punch in the backfield, Phil Maffa. It's one that we created freshman year and, um, you know, one that I think we'll probably have for the rest of our lives. Uh, and just that connection that we have with one another. Then we do a little dap up and then we just wipe each other off, make sure we're clean and ready for the game. So that always gets us encouraged for practice in every game. Shipley says the handshakes are essential for his mindset. Always gets me mentally locked in, focused, and uh, yeah, I'm out here doing this with you know my brothers. Um, so I'm just gonna go out there, smile, have fun, um, have some joy, and uh, just enjoy it. The Tigers just have their bowl game left to enjoy the handshakes, each other, and hopefully a final win. Wildlife agencies are asking for your help in reporting a large invasive lizard species in South Carolina. The South American tegu can grow up to four feet long and weigh about 10 pounds. They eat eggs of other reptiles and also can carry salmonella. DNR says that they've gotten over 100 reported sightings of the tegu in the upstate. The
The lizard is commonly bought as a pet when they're small and then released into the wild by owners who did not do their research. If you ever happen to spot one, snap a picture and report it to South Carolina DNR. Riley, I know we reported on this a couple times, too. They're back. Yeah. Yeah, they've been spotted a couple places, not only in South Carolina, but also uh, areas in Georgia as well. So be on the lookout for them. I would imagine they're tough to miss. If you see a yes. four-foot lizard, <laughs> that run away. A little, Snap a picture a and then run away. Unusual, but hey, maybe there's some tegus around here. Hey, we got a cold night up ahead. Feel like temperatures could be as low as the 20s in a few spots tomorrow morning. I'm going to look at the forecast just after break. Find your break. <laughs> Wrap up a year sales event in Waynesboro Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. Beat the deadlines now through the end of the month. Price drop. Rams, Renegades, and Grand Cherokee L's up to 10 grand off. We'll pay off your credit card up to $1,000. Good to go. Waynesboro.com. spotted with an srp spotted sticker and get 100 dollars. that's right it's that easy get your srp spotted sticker or magnet from any srp location and you could be spotted and win 100 dollars. follow us on facebook for even more chances to win with spot me srp good things are happening at srp if you're calling on 1-800-CALL-KEN don't wait drastic discounts right now the wrap up the year sales event at Waynesboro Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. Rates as low as 2.9%. Lowest prices of the year. Good to go. <laughs> Find your present all right, now to look down the Savannah River, a beautiful end to our Thursday. We do have clear skies overhead, and we are expecting temperatures to be feeling a good bit colder as we head into late tonight. Right now, we're still in the upper 50s, but since we're past sunset now, temperatures will be dropping quick. Most spots in the mid-50s from Thompson to Edgefield up at the lake. They're currently 58. Aiken, you're at 57. Waynesboro there in Burke County, you got 57 degrees. I'd imagine places like Sardis, Gerard, uh, Keysville, you're going to be similar as well in the upper 50s. And we got a cold start tomorrow morning most spots should be feeling the mid 30s uh, but when you factor in the wind the wind chill could actually um, drop as low as the upper 20s in a few spots so it's going to start getting pretty breezy throughout the day friday and that steady west wind is going to stick around on saturday as well now throughout the day friday we're just going to stay with temps still in, uh, in the 40s by around lunchtime eventually seeing those highs close to 50 later into the afternoon and those gusts will be out of the west anywhere from around 20 25 miles an hour at times good news is it does stay drive the next several days so if you have outdoor plans looking at mostly sunny conditions for our friday and looking good to go for weekend plans too unfortunately new year's day monday that's when we could see a few showers all right thanks riley stick with us we have more news weather and sports coming up after a short break as news 12 live at five continues this is not you it's not me